Welcome to As the Key Turns. I'm David Lehman, and this is uh, well, just a part of my story. Recently, uh, Carlos Leder, a guy that I knew, was released from prison. Now, he was doing 135 years and life. So, you would say, well, a guy's doing life plus 135 years, he's never going to get out of prison. Wrong. That's uh, kind of the point I've been trying to get across in, the, in this uh, video series or on my channel, is that these things that the government is telling you are blatant lies. The stuff like we're going to give a guy life in prison plus 135 years, you would think, well, that means that for sure he's going to die in prison. Not true. Carlos Leder is just a very um, uh, public example of this. This happens all the time. I've got an upcoming video one day I'll be releasing that discusses all the different ways that people are getting out of prison early. Uh, yeah, federal doesn't have parole anymore. They just let you out early. What's the difference, right? Oh, and by the way, where I'm at, I can see my mailbox from here. This is where I live at in the United States. So uh, people are always telling me, oh, yeah, we're going to come find you and do all kinds of evil things. Sure. I live in the woods, buddy, <laughs> you know, when I'm in the U.S. And I'm looking forward to going back to uh, my South American home. Uh, okay, Carlos Leder was one of the things that I wanted to talk about. And remember, this is the guy that... Um, I'll put a link in the description below to my earlier video about him when he tried to um, bribe me and another guy to let him out of prison and that didn't really work out because, yeah, that'd be a stupid move on my part, wouldn't it? And then there's the uh, thing where he told me, oh, I'll be out by Christmas, you know, and I used to tease him every Christmas. Hey, hey, it's Christmas. I see by uh, my watch that uh, today is December 25th and you're still not out of prison. Because I thought, you know, the man's doing life plus 135 years. He's never getting out. Well, guess he fooled me. Last laugh's on him because it's the year 2020. And he's going to be out of prison this Christmas. Um, I wanted to hit on a bunch of things in this video. Uh, people are always asking me all the time, you know, about all these other crazy things that have happened to me. And let's talk about the, the uh, two correctional officers that were arrested for looting that worked at the Baltimore uh, City Jail. When I was in the military police at Fort Meade, Maryland, I ended up chasing some soldier who just refused to pull over. He had this hot little car. I mean, it was like a two-door, some kind of sporty vehicle of some sort. I don't remember the exact make and model, but it was a, it was a hot rod, and he had put a motor in it so big that it didn't actually fit under the hood. He had to cut out some of the wheel wells, and he told me that when he turned really sharp, the wheel would rub against the motor. That's how big of a motor he had, and he could just sit down and just burn the tires. That's It, it was really a souped up thing, and we had this uh, these little Dodge cars back in the 80s they called them k cars and they were just a piece of junk really i mean it was super cheap cars and they didn't go very fast and that's what they gave the military police and the one that i was in the uh, siren didn't work so if i wanted a siren what i had to do <laughs> what i had to do was actually click it over on the radio the old motorola radios i don't know if the cops even use these things anymore i doubt it you clicked it all the way over and it was supposed to make a siren sound and another one you'd click and it'd make a yelp sound and another one you'd clip and, and it would make a pa you know where you could you could address a crowd or something and um our siren didn't work so what I did is I would put it on PA and then I would make the sound like a siren. I'd go woo or something, you know, it was pretty funny. So that's how we made a siren sound. And we ended up chasing this guy all through, all around um, Fort Meade. And eventually he came to a T intersection. At the end of the T intersection was uh, uh, a, a soldier's home. Because, you know, on base housing. And this guy tried to turn and he he couldn't turn properly he was going way too fast and he ended up crashing through the uh, the uh, road the way there where he, he snapped off the wheels like bow wheels look like this he snapped them off so they look like that as he slid through the thing he slid all the way across this guy's front yard and ended up crashing on his porch and then 
I was way behind him and you know, uh, I don't know if you know anything, but when the cops get in pursuit, everybody and their brother shows up to this pursuit. So we ended up having the, the uh, National Security Agency, you know, that's them spy guys, you know, that, that uh, listen to all your phone calls and stuff. Well, they have a police department for them. And uh, they showed up, the Federal Protective showed up, I think Prince George's County showed up, um, of course every MP on the post showed up, all kinds of people. A federal Protective Service was there. They had agencies I never heard of. We didn't actually have a helicopter, but I'm surprised one of them didn't show up. So anyway, I was a bit irritated because this guy um, endangered all these people's lives, you know, by running from the police. And um, my friends thought I was going to like beat him up or something when we got there. And then we went and I later had to go to um, court with this guy and the judge got really pissed he felt about it about the way I did you know like, hey you're endangering people's lives and first of all he said you are mentally ill and uh, he said um, he was gonna make this guy go to some kind of mental counseling or be evaluated or something like that and they were gonna give him seven days in the Baltimore City Jail the guy's lawyer freaked out and said oh my god not the Baltimore City Jail and and even the prosecuting attorney got um, a shocked look on his face like oh no not the Baltimore City Jail and both defense and prosecution said to the judge please don't send this guy to the Baltimore City Jail he won't survive it and I'm like wow this is a trained soldier you know I think he was some sort of medic I said just don't send him to the Baltimore City Jail and um, finally the judge said, okay, I want him to serve seven days in jail somewhere. If you people can arrange to send him to somewhere else, then by all means, uh, do so. But uh, I don't care. And I asked the uh, prosecutor, I said, hey man, what's so bad about the Baltimore City Jail? He said, that place is hell on earth. You don't want to send anybody there. He said, much less one of you soldiers, because uh, then people will eat you alive. I'm like, wow, really? And uh, I knew that was a fact because I ended up uh, arresting people that were on post from Baltimore, and uh, they always fought us. And so we did that uh, now famous stuff that you see where we end up choking people out. Well, I've, I've done just that with some suspects that were fighting me, and uh, they didn't get murdered. Uh, I used what force I needed to use to control them. Once I got them under control in handcuffs, they went in the back of the car, but uh, apparently they don't do that everywhere. Um, so uh, I wanted to talk about that. Let's talk about the stuff that's going on now that we're talking about people getting murdered and things. When I was in Germany, I used to work at the Stuttgart Police Station. The Stuttgart Police Station had a German liaison officers. Every shift, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, had a German policeman assigned to us at the um, Stuttgart Military Police Station. Now what the German police always liked to do is they took their older officers, the ones they didn't want on the street fighting with people, and they were more experienced and spoke good English, and they would assign them to us at the Stuttgart Military Police Station and we would talk to them or I would talk to them and things that I would talk to them about was you know they I was a veteran or well, I was a soldier they were veterans in almost every case they were veterans and we had people there that were former commanders of U-boats um, members of the um, Wehrmacht uh, just ordinary guys in the, you know in the Luftwaffe <laughs> like a mechanic or something. One guy was an electrician with the Luftwaffe. People like that. The guy that was a U-boat commander was formerly a uh, member of the Nazi party because apparently to uh, rise to the rank of uh, commanding officer of a U-boat you had to be um, politically correct in, in Nazi Germany and one way to do that was to be a member of the Nazi party. And he was telling me one, one long evening that uh, when he was originally, uh, when, when Germany started to switch over, when Hitler started to, uh, to campaign, he supported the Nazi party. And I said, oh my God, what, 
what's the matter with you? Why would you do that? And he said, well, I'm glad you asked me that. He said, I was a guy without a job. I didn't, I didn't have, uh, you know, enough to eat. And these people offered me a job. They told me they were going to fix Germany. And he said in the beginning, he thought that that's what they were doing. He said people started getting back to work. They started having big projects. Everybody worked together. Um, it, it was just an all-around great deal as far as he was concerned. He said when he first realized that when you know everything went to hell is when they forced him into the Navy. And he ended up, uh, you know, people were trying to murder him all the time. And what he used to do was he made a pact with his crew. Can't believe that people would do this. He made a pact with his crew. And in the, in the late 1940s, he said, look, what we're going to do is go out in the English Channel. We're going to sink to the bottom of the channel. We're going to wait there. And then after the uh, midnight, or at some point, we're going to try to make sure that there's no other vessels around. We're going to surface and recharge our batteries and get new air. And then we're going to drop back to the bottom of the, of the channel and we're going to sit there. And after the, the patrol period is over, and I think it was like five or ten days, it was, sounded really short to me, we're going to go back to port, and everybody's going to say, hey, we didn't see nothing. Um, you know, he said he even dumped a torpedo once. Just dumped it. Uh, things like that. And then they went back. And I said, well, why the hell would you do that? You were a, a member of the Nazi party. I mean, you know, wouldn't you support the, the, the stuff? He said, no. By that time, they were killing all the U-boats. He said, if I had to fire a torpedo at any British uh, uh, vessel, they'd have sunk me and killed him, uh, everybody. He said, I can take you to the place where they made the memorial for my friends uh, who did fire a torpedo, but uh, they never recovered their bodies, things like that. So my point was with this guy was, you know, sometimes it seems like really a great idea at the time, but it turns out that they're Nazis for God's sakes. And uh, you're about to sell yourself into slavery, which is what he told me. And another guy told me that basically the same story, except he was in the Wehrmacht, which is the German army of the time. And he said that he didn't really realize until they sent him into Poland. And he said he really understood it when he was captured by the Russians during a Russian winter and he spent 10 years in, in a Soviet prison for the high crime of taking up arms against the Soviet people. And he came back in 1955. So, you know, there was those kind of folks. And what I learned from them was there's not really much difference between a Nazi and a socialist. And I know everybody's going to say, oh, no, no, that's wrong. Nazis are right wing and socialists are left wing. You're absolutely incorrect. The only difference is socialists want to have everybody in the world a socialist. They want to have all these people give up their individual rights for the collective. That's a socialist. They sing the Internationale, which is their theme song. The Nazis wanted to do exactly the same thing, except only apply it to their country, their Germany, their, their Reich. So, um, as far as the individual is concerned, there's no difference than if the Nazis are running your country or the socialists or communists are running your country. You personally have uh, no rights to property and you're going to do everything for the collective. The collective is either going to be a worldwide collective or it's going to be a national collective. That's why my uh, German friends would always be very down on nationalists and I never understood that until many years later. Um, so I think we all went on with that. Now I got a I got a dilemma. Seems like now, nowadays, right here in my town, right here in my town, my, and, and I'll put a picture of them, of my local police department is taking a knee, which I always thought that meant uh, subservience or um, I hate my country because uh, we're all racist or some damn thing. This Kaepernick guy, you know, everybody used to say, oh, well, that was so bad because during the national anthem he'd take a knee. Well, I still think that was bad. So, 
I don't support them. Patreon and YouTube have both donated. Uh, Patreon donated $50,000, and I forget what it was YouTube did, but it was like millions to uh, Black Lives Matter. So it seems to me that I'm helping to support the group that I don't like, the socialists. And for me, socialist and Nazi is the same group. So when I say socialist or Nazi, I use them interchangeably because as far as the individual is concerned, it's the same bunch. So I don't want to support the Nazis and the socialists, uh, but by making this video right here and expressing my view, I'm actually am supporting those groups. So uh, if you guys got an alternative, I'd sure like to hear it in the comments below as uh, I don't want to support Black Lives Matter. Okay, and the reason I don't support Black Lives Matter is because of their, their stuff with um, chanting, wrap the cops in a blanket and fry them like bacon, what do we want, kill dead cops, when do we want it, now, and people will say, well, that's not true, bull. That was true, that was their, their uh, protests. And then they don't want, they don't want prisons, and they want to defund the police. Uh, that's just anti to everything that I've ever, ever done. My whole existence has been prisons, police, the military, and I would not recommend any young person today to go into those fields. I would recommend anything. My own children, uh, I would refuse to support going into any of those fields that, that I ever did before because the nation has changed. And then, let's try to piss off everybody now. Uh, recently, after long and deep thought, I wouldn't fight for this country again. And the reason is, this country is going down the road to the Nazis and the socialists. Yeah, they're the same people. And I never supported the Nazis and the socialists, and I'm not going to support them now. And if this country, through its democracy, just like Germany in the early 1930s, votes in the Nazis, I wouldn't support them either. I uh, had a girlfriend a long time ago whose uh, uncle uh, went to South Africa to avoid being part of the Nazi war machine. Uh, that's kind of what I would think would be the right thing to do. So. If you guys got a solution to uh, me continuing my hobby and yet not supporting the, the communist, socialist, Nazi people, uh, I'd sure like to hear it. And that's my thinking on it. So you can all go and say, uh, yeah, he's a big racist because he has white skin and he doesn't support uh, Black Lives Matter. Uh, then so be it. Make your, your comments below. And... As always, don't be an ass, hit the like button down there, and thanks for watching.